Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Very excited to be with you today because today I am speaking with Angel Deer, a mystic, medicine man, teacher, permaculturist, beekeeper, and international speaker. Angel has dedicated his whole life to remembering and teaching ancient wisdom through the lineages of Andean cosmology and Norse shamanism. The Dare to Dream podcast has won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, won the COVR Award for Best Radio Podcast Show, Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it's high ranking under self-improvement on Apple Podcasts. Just a note on membership on YouTube, youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. It's open, so go ahead and join because you'll get all the cool emojis that we can communicate with. Plus we'll be having a lot of private sessions there that the public cannot partake in. I wanna thank you to Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work out in the world. If you'd like to become a facilitator or take one of their classes anywhere in the world, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger, Media Visibility Specialist, also a certified shamanic practitioner and a Moon Aiki rights practitioner. I'm also a book writing coach, so I help you to write your book. And also, I guarantee my company will take your book to international best-selling status. And finally, I do some PR work, some publicity work for a handful of spiritual messengers who are seeking to get booked on more radio and podcast shows and most importantly, get massive results from each of these. Because I know your phenomenal interest in starseed information and galactic information, I've got a free gift for you. So this is the news portion here. I have a free starseed report and video where we break down 19 different star seeds so you can learn your origins, your gifts, your strengths, your weaknesses, your mission, your purpose, sometimes even what you look like. You will find yourself in these reports and in these videos. Just go to galactic-shaman.com, get your free gift there. It's also in the show notes, this link. And I have a new program that's opening up soon. The last one was in Incredible. The five weeks of shamanic healing, just beautiful. People all over the world join. So you'll have another chance in September. I will be doing a three-week program on animal spirit medicine. And this is also a very healing program. Most people don't realize the medicine that animals carry within them. And so you can begin this profound journey with me in the sacred mystical realm of animal beings who've chosen to share their wisdom here on earth. And that's at myvisibility.site slash shamanic. Also in the show notes, myvisibility.site slash shamanic. Well, my guest today is Angel Deer, founder of The Sanctuary, a revered shamanic healing center nestled in the heart of the Catskill Mountains, New York. He's the author of the book, The Sacred Web, the magical craft of your sacred shamanic space. Angel creates a haven for individuals seeking connection with nature and ancient wisdom teachings. Additionally, he serves as the founder and executive director of the New York Bee Sanctuary. Angel reached the pinnacle of corporate success, which was then accompanied by a profound realization that the life he was building was actually lacking meaning. He embarked on a deeper exploration of spirituality and holistic wellness. He was drawn to the ancient wisdom of Andean cosmology and Norse shamanism, and Angel immersed himself and embraced his purpose as a shaman, mystic, and healer. His unique journey has led him to become a sought-after international speaker, sharing his insights on spirituality, wellness, and environmental stewardship. Angel has spoken in front of global audiences at the French Embassy in New York 
at Harvard Business School and at the Parsons School of Design in New York City. You can learn more about him at thesanctuaryheal.com. And with that, I welcome Angel to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you here. Great to be with you, Davey. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. I want to start with your name, Angel with two L's and Dear, D-E-E-R, like the animal. How did you come to acquire those names? Mm, that was a, a long process. Um Angel was the name of my grandfather, who mm. was a healer. Mm. And uh, it's in reference to the lineage of uh, medicine people, healers in my family, uh, that have come down this uh, line of men every other generation. So that kind of skip a generation every time. And um, I just added... Uh, to L there because L in uh, French language is pronounced uh, like wing, like a, like a wing. So it's like two wings, right? Um, and the family name um, is my connection to the deer spirit, the deer tribes, the deer animals that has been present my whole life, but which in the last 15 years of my path, I've been I've been asked to embody that medicine, to understand that medicine, to remember that medicine. And through many ceremonies and rituals and finally initiation, um, I was asked um, to take that name. So that's my legal name now. That's not just a name I'm using uh, for my podcast or work. Uh, and it's a process. I'm still getting constant uh, teachings in how to walk like a deer in this human life, in this body, as this two-legged body. What does that mean to carry uh, ourself from that energy space? Um, and I guess it's going to be a life process to keep embodying the, the name. Yeah. Uh, what does deer medicine mean? And what does it mean to you? What is the deer yeah. and what is its wisdom and its purpose? Okay. So we have, what, an hour for it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the deer is, you know, what there, there are many, many teachings. It's a very ancient uh, animal in many medicine well and cosmologies. Uh, the deer in the Andean cosmology, the cosmology from the Andes, uh, which is where my teachers are coming from, uh, sit in the north uh, direction. And uh, north is the direction of the elders, the ancestors. It's a direction of all our relations, ultimately, right? And yeah. it's not just the ancestors of this earth, but it's what came before, right? So that's the antlers, right? Every point on the antlers uh, get you deeper. And the deer has that particularity that it sheds its antler every year to regrow bigger antlers. So it connects us to this uh, aspect of the teaching, the difference between knowledge and wisdom uh, knowledge is knowing more it's filling our mind with you know more pages basically wisdom is the not knowing space it's the space of, of surrender of not knowing and the deer as the age showing us the way how to do that to release what we know to let drop of the antlers in order to grow bigger antlers more connected antlers more points mm -hmm. at the same time he walks on the earth with four legs, two antlers, four legs. So he stay very grounded, very present. And that's how he bring the medicine onto the earth, seeding the medicine in some ways, right? So just by observing it and just understanding that we can get a lot of teachings. And Does that mean then that, that when you embody dear medicine, that you're basically a conduit yourself, Angel, that you receive the information, but because you are here in the 3D earth, you're able to transmit that, but you're supported by heaven and earth? Yeah, it does mean that with the particularity that because there is four legs and only two antler, that the goal is really to bring the wisdom down to make sure it's anchored, it's grounded, it's connected to land, to, to the reality, right? That is here uh, and to stay grounded, to stay connected. And if you have four legs, you can stay more grounded, obviously. So from a shamanic perspective, it means the 
underworld journey needs to be done more often than the upper world journeys. Both mm -hmm. are beneficial, both are important. But if we want to honor this body, this incarnation, this moment that is very short, right? Uh, that we are coming here in that body that we have to make sure we turn our teachings towards this reality. Mm -hmm. what we're witnessing you know what is happening obviously so it's we don't rush too quickly to escape this reality <laughs> yeah yeah powerful stuff you you have this wild journey from corporate to who you are right now and because i understand this path it is not static it is always becoming always unfolding it's mm -hmm. fascinating and so to go from corporate to shaman that must have been remarkable. Were there inherent challenges along the way that you faced in the journey? And how did you overcome them? There were many challenges. Uh, I think it's mainly challenges, right? The path of initiation, traditional initiations are very difficult. And they potentially are life-threatening uh, mm -hmm. in traditional community, right? You, you are put in situation that potentially you can die physically, but the goal is that you die of the self that you are, right? And because I did not grow up in a culture that really understood uh, that ancient wisdom, it was, I think, even more challenging mm -hmm. for me because I had to find the right elders, teachers, rituals that would support this transformation. And, you know, for a long time, I lived a life that was not my life, what it was supposed to be. Not saying it was not necessary because I got a lot from that right. even for today. Uh, but I think it's more difficult when you can just you not know, turn to one elder that is there and says, this is why this is happening. This is why you are suffering. This is why you are feeling that way. Even more difficult, I guess, because I was really good and successful in my corporate CEO entrepreneur work and so those success very often push the big question back in time they, they're pushing them further uh because the suffering is not fully acknowledged because you have also the blessing you know of that life and so it took me a little bit of time to realize that what was meant for me was not what i was living i had no idea that i would be doing what i do it's not like i said i want to become that right uh, I had no idea what point B was going to be, but point A was suffering for me, was lacking meaning and purpose. And I had this deep, I guess, knowing or calling, however you call it, since I was very little about the mystical, about the invisible. I always was very connected to it. I didn't do anything with it because it didn't, you know, I had space in my life at the time. Um, but I was thirsty for that you know i was craving and i could not find what to drink to to feel that until i met masters and teachers and incredible uh elders that helped me understand where this suffering were coming from right? mm. did your grandfather participate at all since you received the gift down the line from him not really you know he was uh my grandfather never stepped, let's say, as a full time doing that. He always had a corporate life and business life and, you know, was running many business. But everybody knew in the village where we're from and in the state where we're from and even from further away that he was a healer. Um, he was a very powerful healer. I know he passed away now seven or eight years ago. And he could just, just put his hand on someone and just heal someone in literally a few seconds. It was very simple what he was doing, but very profound. And he always told me since I was little that I had this gift, but I literally had no idea what he was talking about, how to do it. Uh, yeah, I didn't really understand it uh, until way later on in, in my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now you practice, you're knowledgeable about Andean cosmology, about Norse shamanism. My lineage is also Andean. Um, and it's amazing that every teacher, uh, now three males and one female, all from Peru, who could, you know, mm -hmm. you can't write this stuff. And I wasn't searching for it. And although I have not gone into Norse shamanism, I am really into Vikings and I watch 
all these TV shows about Viking history. I'm watching one right now, uh, Viking Valhalla, that is showing the history of Freitas. And so these are very powerful traditions you practice. I know Andean cosmology, it's an in-depth transmission of ancestral wisdom of the ancients, the keepers of the master teachings, and it's mostly sheltered by very high Andean priests, uh, priests, excuse me. The, um, yeah, the Inca Andean cosmology considers man, nature, Pachamama, Mother Earth. This is a whole. There is no separation. We live closely. We respect. We live in Aini, in reciprocity, and we're perpetually related. How is it for you, Angel, this Andean cosmology and the culture of the ancient wisdom that you studied and remembered? It is, I guess, ultimately uh, a sacred map that saved my life. I think it's a sacred map that can potentially save humanity from itself. <laughs> um, you know, I've been teaching it for many years now, and, and I'm still a student where students are all life of those teachings. You know, it's a never ending quest of understanding. Um, but wherever I am at a crossroad, whenever I'm facing a challenging situation, whenever I'm experiencing a challenging emotion, you know, whatever is going on in my life, I can turn toward that map and see where I am in it and find direction. So it's a little bit saying, well, I'm lost maybe sometime in this world or I'm lost in my world <laughs> in there, you know, whatever that is. But then you can look at a different perspective, a timeless perspective, an ancient perspective that's in, well, you're lost in the world you are in or in this world of yours, but this is where you are on this map. There are a place you are in. There are directions you can take. There are specific prayers and ritual for that place. This is a shadow aspect. This is a light aspect of it. This is what's going on. And this is what you can do, which animal you can work with, which plant you can work with, which kind of ceremony you can do to get you back into the right direction or let's say a better direction maybe than just spinning your wheels. And for me, that's ultimately what it is. It's a GPS or a compass for the soul. When the soul is lost, that technology that is the most advanced technology on earth probably tells you exactly how to go about it and you know it's like you said it's very connected to the earth and to the ancestors to the mountains to the river the sun it's connected to the corn it's connected to many many aspects of that cosmology and very often most of the teachers you know including my teacher uh, are people that are farmers that are land caretakers you know they grow corn and maybe they have bees too and they work with the plants right so they are somehow, interestingly, you know, a little bit like the deer medicine. They are very grounded and very connected to the community and what is happening. And at the same time, the level of the vibration of the teaching that are coming from other realms are quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's what I really like about that cosmology is that it gives you access to a very connected and grounded life. So you're not just, you know, sounding crazy you're very present you're very effective and you're very you know um, you are a big medicine for this world and at the same time you are in connection to very mystical teachings mystical beings things that you know some of my journey with a deer you know i said one day i'll probably write a book about it but they are quite out there right they are extraordinary but there's always that intention in this teaching. Okay, it's great maybe to connect to a star beings or to high frequency beings. But how does this translate into life, into your life? How does it improve life on earth for all your relations? How do you bring this down and weave it into that lower vibration that we are living in right now, right? And um, I think that's, it always tells you what to do. 
Wow. It never, it never was wrong. You know, it's not just like I believe in it. I, I know it's true, right? It's not just a belief. I'm, it's my experience every time I do it. I'm going to ask you to give an experience. I've never heard it described like that. I love that description. And it is so beautiful, the idea that you're never alone. You have a map. So first, I'd like to know when you say map. Now, do you mean the four directions? It's really six directions. Do you mean that as a map, the medicine wheel? Or do you mean the upper world, the middle world, the lower world? Or what is the map that you use in your practice? All of that. The map is multidimensional. So yeah, you can use a map of four direction. You can use a map of seven directions. You can use the map of the three patches, the three worlds of that cosmology, uh, Uku Pacha, Kai Pacha, Hanan Pacha. And then there are other dimensions in times and space that are more on the wheel. Mm. Um, you have the Chakana, which is the ancient and then cross, uh, which is, you know, looks like a three dimensional cross, but it's a four dimensional, five dimensional, six dimensional cross. It has many layers to it. So yeah, it's all of that together. And obviously, depending on uh, what it is that you are trying to understand, you might go to one aspect of the map or an other aspect of the map. You know on Google Map where you can do just the 3D, but you can do the satellite view and you can probably do one with the traffic, right? So it's a little bit like that. You can layers, you can layers those map. If you take them separately, they look very different. The three worlds and the four direction or the seven direction can feel very bizarre. It's like, well, is there four direction? Why well, is there only three worlds? Where is the fourth one? If there is four elements. But once you start layering them, layering the teachings, I think that's where very much in the image of the weaving of the women in Peru that we very intricate design, which is a reflection of that cosmology, you can make this beautiful tapestry. And ultimately, you know, that's what you are doing. You're weaving the tapestry of your life. Oof. And you're weaving that with everyone and everything, seen and unseen, known and unknown. So you are participating in that great story of yours, in this myth of yours that is unfolding. Yeah. So these teachings were tr transmitted through the huacas, mm -hmm. are the ancient power temples. And in these temples, there were initiates who were trained and they began their journey, this really long pilgrimage for their own evolution of consciousness and power because they wanted to reach the Hana Pacha, the heaven. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you have yourself experienced that? Yes, it's, um, you know, the Wakas is one part of the, of the teachers, right? There are three uh, families uh, there's a human family, there is what we call the wild family, and then there are the the big forces. Uh, the workers are part of the big forces, but the sun is part of it. You know, there are other um, aspects of that. Um, and the goal you mentioned, Aini, sacred reciprocity, the goal is living in harmony between the three families. And we're using our the other families, the non-human families relate, communicate, live in sacred reciprocity to understand how we do not live in sacred reciprocity most of the time. And we use this teaching of this triangle between the three families. You see, that's another dimension. There's only three here and not four or not seven um, to see how we can return to that connection to what we can call the universe, God, creator, the mystery, because we are part of it. And I think, you know, we knew that when we were born, we completely connected to that when we were born, but then came a time where obviously we forgot because of education, because of our family, because of the systems we are living in. And we're on this quest of remembering, you know, even I just want to finish by that because even when the teachings are very mystical, and seems very, very complex. They feel like home in our belly. They feel like we're just back home. And that's a really good compass to know it, that it is true wisdom. That is somehow we, we've known that.
All right, we mm. remember that. Yes, that's really well said. And I resonate deeply with that. For me, shamanism, well, I mean, maybe not the last thing I would have ever expected to show up or be my path, but I, it was pretty there in the list, you know? And just this huge surprise and gift for mm -hmm. sure. Um, Life-changing. I would never be here if I hadn't many years ago drunk ayahuasca and had the divine come and mm -hmm. give me some information about myself. Massively confusing at the time. But she was so beautiful and gentle and she was also relentless in mm -hmm. imparting this information to me, so much so that when I came back to the States, I was really confused, uh, but I have some really gifted friends who helped me in the beginning, you know, to unearth some of what was going on. And now, I mean, very different, but um, so beautiful how you described it as this feeling of home. Yes. And this feeling of knowing this, this some kind of resonance there, this ancient, ancient resonance. I think I even read somewhere that we all have a seed of the Inca within us. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe not just people like you, where this is a lineage situation and definitely like a, a destiny path. And somebody like me, like this is so many lifetimes that I have been doing this. And thankfully, you know, this has come up again for me. Um, life-changing, really life-changing stuff. I think even people who haven't had these particular callings, there's something there. And there's something so prevalent right now. Why this? Why the people high in the Andes are allowing some of this information to come out, why the people all over Europe and the Americas and so forth uh, are really picking up on a lot of this. And you said something earlier, which I completely concur with, and I think is an important point. So I want to go back to it. And you were saying, Angel, that these wisdom teachings, actually these practices, were people to allow themselves to experience them and to use them that this could end the issues that are facing humanity right now. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little more in depth? Mm. Well, you know, there are many layers to that. And I definitely, uh, just as a warning, I don't want to say, hey, I have the solution to end suffering on earth, right? Uh, <laughs> that would be very presumptuous. Um, but those teachings, you know, yeah, we call them Inca and then and they come from certain tradition, but ultimately they are universal teachings. They come from the deep observation and connection with nature and the spiritual world. Mm. And the spirits, you know, they might look a little bit different depending where we live, but there is a universal force behind it. And those teachers and elders that have brought this teaching, they say, well, those are the ancient instructions for humanity. They don't say it's ancient instructions for the Incas, or ancient instructions for Americans or, you know, whatever, right? They are universal teachings. Our society today, at least most of the Western world and most of our societies, live very far from those instructions. Because we have disconnected ourselves from the natural world. We think we are separated somehow. We are very often disconnected ourselves from the spiritual world as at least an authentic and honest connection to it, not something we've learned or been taught, something that we really experience. And we have also uh, lost, much longer even for the Western world or European world, right? A very long time ago, the more pagan animist traditions, yeah. thousands of years. But we evolved with that for tens of thousands of years. So it's present in our DNA. So we're a little bit like a zoo animal. <laughs> we, you know, we are living in, in this cage, which is the system, which is the world we have created. We experience depression, discomfort, addictions, pain, anger, you name it. And we don't really know why, because we're kind of born in the zoo. 
we have forgotten that we are the wild animal. We have forgotten our mm. nature and our essence. Mm. And then uh, the zookeepers, or uh, you know, whatever you want to call them, which are the political system, the systems that are in place, are telling us, "No, no, this is this is it." And we are going to make the cage a little bit bigger, and we are going to change that, and we are going to change your food. We're trying to, you know, bring things into the cage instead of looking at what is blocking us from feeling, from being alive, from relating, from connecting, from loving. And unless we break the cage, mm -hmm. unless we break that, we're always going to repeat because we're creating a new cage, but it's still a cage, right? So those cosmologies that tell us this is not life. Life doesn't work that way. And if you don't follow, in fact, the original instruction, they tell you you are going to experience four kind of emotions. You're going to experience anger first. There's a lot of anger. So imbalance in the fire. Mm -hmm. You are going to experience confusion, which is an imbalance in the water. It's not the clean water. Mm -hmm. so you don't see clearly. And confusion, you know, is a little bit particular because sometimes you think you know, but you're confused, right? So confusion is a little bit tricky sometimes. But anger, confusion, you're going to experience separation, thinking that there is others and there is you or there is that and there is you and that some, somehow you're separated. And then you're going to forget. Forget all the teachings. Forget gratitude. Forget compassion. Forget clarity. Forget unity. Forget everything forget love and so when you read the world today from the perspective of that ancient map they told you in that map that was you know 10,000 year old map 20,000 year old we can't we, the world was read into it it's the whole shadow of that map it literally described the world we're living in mm -hmm. and I've studied you know other medicine well and other uh, traditional teachings uh, Native Americans and others, and they speak about that time we're in, this time of prophecy, this time yes. of great change, you know, the time of the, you know, new fire is going to be restarted, the rainbow tribe. There are many different stories and many different prophecy, but those stories that are pre-industrial world, pre the world we are knowing now, or written at that time or transmitted at that time, describe to the every detail what is happening today the hope the beauty of it is that they also this cosmology this prophecy that tell us what to do to avoid you know the suffering or to avoid this collapse i mean not we can't really avoid the collapse but to find a different way to rebuild something different mm -hmm. yeah so Absolutely. Then where is that point of convergence? Where is there a sacred link that takes the human being, the cosmos, the sky, the earth, nature, animals, everything? And through these prophecies, I know like the Pachacuti talks about this is the time of great change. And it's not a myth. It's real. Like you say, we're living in it. What is the solution there? What kind of practices can we engage in so that even at our level, the individual level, we can create change? This is you and I today are meeting on Lionsgate. It's yes. August 8th, incredibly powerful day for intuition, for manifestation. A portal is open, Leo in conjunction with Sirius and, and all of that. So we're actually having this conversation on a very powerful day that could influence people positively. What would you offer them, Angel, that they could start to do and th these ripples would create some positive change? That's a great question. It's also a complex question. <laughs> you know, I wish there was one magic stick uh, to answer that. Um, one thing that is essential, you know, if we acknowledge that this disconnection from nature is a very big wound that we don't really understand fully, right? Like the animal that is born in the zoo doesn't really understand what it's missing because it's never lived in the wild. Um, my teachers, you know, 
my main teacher in Peru, when I wanted to study with him years ago, a long time ago, he didn't want to teach me. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want that responsibility. And then, you know, I keep insisting, I keep, you know, I spent three to six months in Peru every year for over 10 or 15 years now. And one day he gave me a, a seed of corn, one little corn. And he said, I want you to plant this, to take care of it, to grow it. And when you can harvest new corn and plant your own seed, then you come to me and I will teach you. So his first teaching took, you know, over a year, I think two years, yeah. because my first corn didn't really grow very well. Um, what he was trying to show me in that first teaching is my connection to the land, my mm -hmm. connection to the non-human realm. Mm -hmm. So the first aspect we need somehow, and I know it's difficult for many people because we live in cities and we don't have a lot of nature, but there's still an opportunity to grow a seed. There's still an opportunity to go listen to a tree. And yes, it might take you weeks before you hear something because this instrument is rusty and it's going to take time for you to hear, but you can. So there's that first step, reconnecting to nature with something authentic, something real, taking care and giving. That's Aini. Mm -hmm. Sacred reciprocity is not like I beg creator to get something and then I'm going to say thank you. No, say I say thank you and I give something and I might get something in return. So reversing the way we think we get things through paying. I pay and you give me something, right? The spiritual way of sacred reciprocity is different. Like I'm giving first. I'm giving a lot. I'm taking care of that corn for two years. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to receive teaching from my teacher. That is humbling, right? Yeah. Because it's just a little seed of corn. And at the same time, it's everything. And then... You know, once we start reconnecting to that, we have to decenter human from the equation because we're surrounded by human voices constantly, our screens, our TV, mm -hmm. you know, even our podcasts, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the human voices have complexities and they are not fully aligned with the ancient instruction. So we need to go listen to what carries those instructions. Tree, rivers, sun, stars, you know, rocks animals plants ancestors there are so many things where when i have a question instead of just asking the human realms or my own realm going to the other realm see what kind of insight i have asking the runes right we talk about no shamanism i have a lot of runes all over my body you know i walk a lot mm -hmm. with them you know because they always give me a better answer you know it's not like okay this is just superstition no every time i ask and I made a decision by listening to the other voices. He was always wiser. He always get me to a better place. And then, you know, and that's, I think, the complexity into this world. And that's what, you know, probably you and I are trying to do to a certain degree is to build community. Mm -hmm. We need to surround ourselves uh, with authentic teachings, with authentic elders, with things that we can rely on. Because we are literally in a storm. And if you are in tiny boats... That's going to be really difficult. But if you're in a really big boat with a lot of people on board, or better, you're already anchored in your lighthouse, you can withstand that storm, right? And still know where you are going. So it's a great question, but I think it's not one thing we can do. And it can feel very overwhelming, but I always say one step at a time. Maybe tomorrow you meditate for five minutes with a candle. Maybe tomorrow for 10 minutes you go sit with a tree, even if you have just 10 minutes and nothing's going to happen. But you need to start showing spirit, showing the non-humans, showing what is really your true essence, the sacred, beyond this human understanding, that you are interested in it, that you want to listen to it, that you are a student and they are the teachers. And they start teaching. It's always going to be. But if you don't make the step, or if you think, no, 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 I'm just going to read you know, six more books and going to 20 more workshops. <laughs> I mean, some are great. Listen, I teach workshop. I wrote a book, right? But nothing is going to replace direct experience. And yes, we yes. often need teachers and guides for how to approach this direct experience because we don't have them in our families or in our communities. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a bit of a mix. But, you know, shamanism ultimately is a path of self transformation self-revelation this is self-revelation right it means going to be revealed through you 
So you can learn many, many books about shamanism. It's very, you know, trendy now. There's thousands of books, but nothing is going to teach you like a tree. Yes. Like a river, like a star, like your own ceremonial experience. That I know that for sure. Oh my God. So true. My ongoing relationship with Mother Earth is profound. And in the beginning, it was just go in the backyard put your feet in the ground, let your roots go into mother earth and just be with her, just nest with her, connect your heart with her heartbeat. And then I would just do my shamanic practice. And then whatever was coming up for me, I would bring, I would bring to the experience and I would ask questions. I would give and say, you know, what do you feel about this or think about this? And I would get these amazing points of view I would have never considered. And it was a bit twofold. One was Debbie, here's some wisdom, take this. And the other was just this really being held and seen. Mm. And now, I mean, she is a living entity to me. She is absolutely as though it was a person or a spirit that I was involved in. Mm -hmm. She means so much to me. And um, I'm deeply grateful for that relationship. So everything you're saying, what's beautiful is how simple it is. What's beautiful is it is so profound when you allow yourself to interact with these. And these are things that shamans have done forever. They talk to the Apus, they talk to the mountains, they talk to the rivers, the skies, they have relationship with everything, the leaves, you know, they can um, change the weather like magic. And that is a big piece of Aini and of changing, of creating. I've even spent time with the lower world, the Lord of the lower world. And I know some people have very interesting experiences when they go there. Um, mine have always been incredibly powerful and I have a lot of trust also it's for me, he is a he. They're sometimes gender fluid, but he's a he. And and he has also been very kind and compassionate with me and met me and given me, like just lifted my burden a lot. Mm. And yeah, it's, uh, you know, even you saying, you know, it's, yeah, it's thought about something very simple, like putting your feet on the earth. You know, it's revolutionary. Like it's simple, but how many people even people listening, I'm sure, you know, I'm asking, how long ago have you put your feet on the earth, your hand in the dirt? When was it? Maybe it was this morning. Maybe it was right before listening to this, but maybe it was a month ago. You know, for many people, we forget sometimes that because we get advanced on the path, which doesn't really mean anything, that the basic, the connection to the earth, like hands and feet in it are what our ancestor would do all the time my teacher does that every day because he's a uh, farmer right? uh, and it sounds like it's very simple it sounds like oh this is not really big it's not like i'm making a big ceremony and a big altar and a kind of really big prayer but that's what's going to create that relationship you talk about like if i want to have a relationship with you Debbie, and i only talk to you once a month or every year what kind of relationship we have but if every day we connect Right? Every day we take five minutes, 10 minutes to connect. We are going to have a deeper intimacy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're like, oh, I know you. And, right? and it's exactly the same with the non-human world. It's the same with human beings that it is with a non-human world. Often as people say, you know, how often do you do that? How often do you stand in the rain? Just feeling the rain on your skin instead of using an umbrella. Yeah. What was the last time you really felt that? Mm -hmm. Things that seems like Okay, it's just standing in the rain. It's just putting my feet on the ground. But it's literally the first connection. It's literally the roots of those teachings. And they are really, really important to nurture. Mm -hmm. You uh, said something earlier about having runes on yes. you and that you confer with the runes. Yeah, one here. Yeah. Beautiful. You can see there, yeah. Amazing. So you don't have to throw them. You can. <laughs> well, I throw them. I use them, you know, when we have question and, you know, we, my, my wife and I, we always, let's ask the rune first. Mm. And then we see what the rune says. Sometimes we don't like the answer. We do it second <laughs> time. It's the exact same answer. Right. So then. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Here. Right. Well, tell me if I'm pronouncing this right. It's a practice of cedar. It's S E I D R. Am I saying it right? What do you mean by that? 
for the roots. So, so Nordic shamanism, the practice of, I don't know if it's Siddhar or Cedar, a form of, it's the magic and the divination. And that aspect of it, I know, is associated with the goddess Freya or Freja. Freja. Yeah, I mean, with Odin, with, you know, many Norse gods, that are, you know, Odin brought the runes to humanity, to the human realms by making a very big sacrifice in order to receive those teachings and transmit them. Um, they are mainly used by many people, at least as a divination tool, right, <laughs> for asking questions a bit like tarots, uh, tarot cards, right? Uh, but they're way, way more than that. Each rune is a spirit. It has a personality. Each rune represent a world you can travel in, the world of the giants, the world of ice, the world of the fairies, etc. Each rune is associated with a plant or a tree. So if you say, well, I'm really sick right now and you want to ask the rune what portion you need to make, you're just going to use the rune and then you can mix those three plants, right? So you can use it as a plant guidance, as a tree connection, as travel, or you say, well, I'm very confused in my life right now. I have a big decision to make. And shall I go ask the giant or the fairy or the gods or, you know, the gnomes or whatever? You ask the runes and they're going to tell you which world to travel into. So there are many, many layers to it, you know. And, you know, I have an extraordinary teacher that I learned from starting, I don't know, 10, more than 10 years ago. And most people want the divination aspect, you know, and it's great. But there is a shamanic path to the runes. And that shamanic path to the rune requires you to do three, four, five years of training deep into the rune to start opening the ski. The runes are one of those wow. sacred teachings, like most of the you know bigger teachings that have a lot of power are only revealed once you go through you know errors and trials and tribulation and difficulties and really heal a lot so you can carry this level of medicine. Mm -hmm. um yeah they, they are really fascinating and you know it's really just and it's still you know something i'm still learning right still in many ways i know there are many layers that my teacher will never talk about that i have to discover yeah can you tell a story a personal story about your use of norse shamanism uh something that happened to you or for you and what that was like because i'm super fascinated by all these worlds you're describing yeah, many years ago, uh, this land I'm living on, it's a pretty large land upstate New York. And at the time, I didn't have a rigid center on the land, a building for that. You know, I just had my house. And um, I received this vision that I needed to build this whole center. I saw it in my ceremonies and it was very clear. And then I, you know, hired an architect and builders and all of that make some quotes you know and the amount of money necessary to to build that was a lot and it was not money that i had available at the time but i was feeling like it needs to happen now like i was really feeling it and so i asked the rune about it you know pull the rune and say shall i sign this contract with the contractor which means you know a week later you need to give 20 percent of whatever that was and, you know, every month I'm going to have to pay him in the next six months during construction. I didn't have even the 20% down at the time, right? Just, just, I pulled a rune and the rune say, yes, sign. I was like, I don't have the money. Are you sure? And I was like, I don't have the money. So I'm asking you, Freya, Arden, all of you, are you sure I need to sign? Signs. You know, there's a lot of runes. I pulled the same rune twice. The cross, which is a signature. Yes, that's a big yes. So I signed, right? That's called probably, you know, some people say it's crazy and I call that an act of faith. That I'm going to trust more the spiritual world and my guidance system that I use than my own fear and my own mind, my own limitation. And then literally three days later, I iterated the exact amount i needed to build the whole thing we're talking about hundred and fourteen thousand dollars right one one four zero 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 that's what i needed that was the exact amount of the contract that's what i received as a gift what? completely unexpected literally out of nowhere nowhere wow. two days later 
Yes. So I could pay the deposit, you know, and then I could finish the whole construction. I didn't have to worry about it. So that's a big one, you know, when I use the runes literally for a very big decision into my life. And, you know, thanks God I did it and the center got built and, you know, then it's history. But how difficult is it in our lives when we don't have tools like that? Not just the rune. It could be, you know, maybe you don't like the runes and it's another tool for you. But where you don't have such a deep relation to a spiritual being, a tool, whatever it is, that you trust it with your life. Wow. Right? That you have such connection to it. And you know it's true. No, it's easy to believe when things go well, I always tell people, right? But when it's complicated or you're in a situation to really trust that, that's how you deepen the connection. Because you saying to whatever that is, yes, like 100% yes. And what they're saying in response, yes, 100% yes, right? So that's kind of many ways, you know, some form of initiation, like you're starting to materialize your life from a different perspective. You're starting to understand that we are not just this body. Yes, we are that, but we are more. We are other things. And in a world that is very chaotic and more and more chaotic, that is very confused, that is very you know polarized, that is very complex to navigate, you need a very clear map. You need a very clear, you know, GPS. Imagine if, I don't know, Google Map was confused, like the world is. Or turn right or maybe left, you know. I don't really know, right? But that's a little bit the wisdom we are listening to, right? <laughs> so, that the would be a big that, problem. <laughs> right, but we all trust Google Map or our GPS in our car, but we don't trust spirit. Mm. that's how we have fell into the power of the technology god as i call them or the other gods right they're still entities they're still you know spiritual there's still something moving their energy moving in there but they don't have the knowledge of what's created this whole universe yeah. what created your body what's beating my heart right now and i'd rather trust the one that created my body because it seems pretty incredible if you ask me yeah. in terms of technology right so we have to shed all of that right all those belief to to get to this depth of connection ultimately you keep bringing up practices and um great story that you told that is like signing x i'm in and 401k plan thank you that is so miraculous and beautiful also your book ta-da um, I want to talk a little bit about the sacred web that I read, because one of the things you say in this book is sacred space needs consistency. Spirits need to know who is there. And as you're, you're writing this as my teacher elder often shared with me. So if we keep changing the altar. The spirit needs to know who is there or more importantly, what we are praying for. Can you explain that more deeply? Well, first, I like that you probably picked up on the one thing that's important in the book. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff, but I think this is the one thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you consider the altar, your sacred space, you know, however it's designed, there are different traditions as the internet or the window into the other world. Mm -hmm. You're on that side, there is an altar, and on the other side is spirit. So spirits, you know, they have all those windows, which is the view into our souls and into our world. They can see, you know, through our sacred space. They can see in the sacred sites. They, you know, they're very, it's very open there because that's a place for the energy to move in and out through prayers and rituals. If spirits, you know, come today and, and look at this window and it's like, who is that? I saw Debbie live there. It looks like it's, I don't know. Who is that? Christina? <laughs> Right, because if you change your altar completely and all the time, yeah. or if you change your prayer all the time, there is no consistency, right? Then they have a hard time to know what you really want, and if it's really you. 
Mm-hmm. So there is a need for consistency in our practices, in our rituals, in our altars, right? And the construction of the altar is very important because of that. And at the same time, there's a need for fluidity, for evolving. Mm. Let's say you just lost someone. Your altar is going to change a little bit. You're going to bring something on it for that loss. Maybe you're becoming a mother or something happened in your life and you want to shift your altar. Maybe you are starting a whole different new project and you that prayer is therefore is going to shift and your altar needs to shift. We just enter a new season. The fall season is going to come in a few months. The altar needs to shift to represent the forces of the cosmos that are moving. You know, in the fall, that's not the same forces that in the summer. So there are a need for staying connected to what's moving in our world. But there are also anchors that are important so they know who is there, what you're asking for. And that's, you know, my goal with the book was to help people Either they are really beginners in that or they're very advanced to, you know, and it's funny because you pick up kind of the most important thing there. Yeah, maybe if you're very advanced, that's the thing to really remember because even when we're really good at it or we're pretty advanced on our path, there are the basics that we often forget. At least I do, you know. Absolutely. I'm so excited. I I love hearing you say this because I'm actually starting... Tomorrow through the weekend, I am starting a an altar, a Pachacuti Mesa tradition mm-hmm. uh, through somebody else's lineage, but it's a one-year program. And it literally is about building an altar. I have another altar, but I found they don't cross-pollinate. That, mm-hmm. you know, everybody's got a different tradition. And I am super open. I'm very excited about learning this new tradition, this living tradition. I think my other Well, it's really my mesa, I think more than my altar, my first one, because that's really my healing toolkit when I work with other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I want to ask you, where can people get your book? And also, oh, I love Zoom. (laughs) I'll just keep it right here. But also, where can they work with you? How do they work with you? What do you offer? So for the book, you know, it's available worldwide on most platforms. You know, they can go on Amazon, uh, anywhere, and just search, you know, The Sacred Web, Angel Deer, and you can find the book there. Um, and it's in print, ebooks, and art cover available. Uh, for the teaching, the best is my website on the sanctuaryheal.com, H-E-A-L.com, um, where, you know, I have... In-person classes where I'm teaching live. Uh, Those are long one-year program. We have a big one starting every January. It's called the Path of the Warrior, which is Shamanic Foundations. Um, But I also do shorter teachings, a week, a month, you know, online. And also I have three programs um, that one of them is our most famous one is called Becoming the Mystic, which is an online on-demand class. So I'm teaching it, but obviously it's online on-demand. And it's, I loved recording it. And, you know, I tried to put in it, you know, how do we open that connection? We've been talking about what kind of the practice, right? So it's for all the budgets, right? It depends on how much time you have. If you're close to me, if you're far away, you can do on demand. Uh, But if you're, you know, want to do longer program or retreat or come with us in Peru, you know, then it will be in person. Wow. That's on my website. Yeah. Very nice. And I just want to say as someone who works on and with books, people like i know what this stuff costs by the way when you go into color and i know what it takes it's a beautiful beautiful book right so there's not just beautiful information but i mean you really took and i'm sorry for the invisible book here and there but <laughs> i just wanted to show people it's yeah, stunning thank you. and yeah, i mean it needs to be inspiring right Someone told me one day, you know, when you read a book, it's like reading a spell, right? Because they change you. Uh-huh. You want the spell to be beautiful, right? And then to be nice. <laughs> I love it. So books as spells, this one certainly weaves its web. If you want to get your copy, Sacred Web, Amazon, and also go to his website and all major bookstores. It's worth it. If you're ready to start a practice, this is actually perfect in light of everything we've been talking to. And just so people know if and when they, let's just say when, we're going to be very proactive that we're setting some people up for great success and a great practice to make their sacred shamanic space. 
how can they maintain that sacredness of their space, especially where there is these constant shifts, constant changes in life? To me, the best answer, maybe because I'm a new dad, is the same way you take care of your kids. Even if you have a busy day, even if you know, you're not feeling well, mm -hmm. you feed them, you change them, you bath them, you take care of them like a child or a lover. You yeah. are, uh, your sacred space, it's not when you have time. It's not, you know, because it's convenient. It's a relationship to a living entity, to something that is going to give you more in your life probably than anything else you've ever met or you will ever know. How much love do you want to give to that? How much care? Well, you decide, right? But that's what you'll get back. Today is my dog's birthday. Shelby was born on 8-8 eight, eight, in an eight year. And this 2024 is an eight year. So she's got infinite abundance everywhere. And I always celebrate her birthday. I looked at my calendar this morning because my first thought was there's this beautiful off-leash park. I wanted to take her and her sister dog so that they could just run free and have a beautiful start to their day before they have their doggy yogurt ice cream. And I saw that I had blown it and inadvertently put something early this morning on my calendar. And I just sat there for a minute thinking about, oh, I really should honor that appointment. And then thinking about Shelby and then thinking about that appointment and thinking about Shelby. And I thought, you know, she won't be here forever. And I won't have this magnificence that I have with her forever. And I honor everything she is to me, much like you said about having a child. And I know you've had a child. And to me, I thought she matters more than anything. I am canceling. I will make right with this appointment. I will reschedule it. But she's coming first. She's getting her day. And I felt so good about that. And the reciprocity immediately, you know, we came back. There was a message. They said, we can fit you in tomorrow. And easy peasy, like honoring yeah. what is energetically right and where the mm -hmm. love is, giving attention to. Mm -hmm. That also is a practice that would change the world. Yeah, we are, we are a sacred being, you know. Ultimately, the most important ceremony is your life. That's the one ceremony. The other ceremony are little reminders. And so it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. Sometimes we're not going to be good, in fact, at, at <laughs> keeping this mind secret or action secret but we need to remind ourselves that's really what we're here for walking in sacred way remembering the secret in us and opening it to the world an angel this is dare to dream what do you next dare to dream what are your future dreams and goals hmm. well i have a really big project um i can't really uh, share about what it is yet for next year that might radically change my life, okay. um, my offerings in beautiful, beautiful way. And uh, we're in the baby step. <laughs> it's funny, he was born almost at the same time as my daughter three months ago, like the ID and, and the vision. And I think she brought that with her uh, for me as a gift in our life. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for ways, you know, ultimately on how can we spread this wisdom wider while staying grounded authentic humble you know it's always we have to be careful you know what are we really chasing here um and my goals have always been that in regards to the land in regards to my clients in regards to the work that i do but i think for a long time in my life i haven't dreamed big enough <laughs> And people will say, well, your life is amazing. And I say, yeah, but we're kind of infinite beings where there is so much potential. And I know that everything we manifest start in the mind and in the invisible. So if my thoughts are, oh, I can only do this, that's what I'm going to manifest, right? So I'm starting a project, which is a big dream, a bigger dream. Uh, and that's what, you know, I'm glad you asked that today because it's a good day to kind of speak it out for the first time uh beyond my wife and i <laughs> so it's out there now and uh yeah we'll start where the map of this cosmology tells me to start 
which is in the unseen, in the prayer space, in with the one that creates, really, with the one that brings things to us. Uh, in that cosmology, we don't beg. We don't really, we are co-creator, you know, and remembering that something wants to create with me. That's why I have visions. It's coming from somewhere and I want to help that. So staying in, in touch with that uh, and the best of malleability, I guess. Mm, wow. Maybe we'll talk in a year and, you know, we're like, remember, baby, we met on the Lion's Gate. Well, it happened. <laughs> I see that already as being true for you. The world needs this information. The world needs who you've chosen and allowed to come through you. I honor who you are, Angel and the work you do. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Debbie. Hmm. And folks, if you would like to check out more about him, go to his website at thesanctuaryheal.com. And I'm going to end today's show with this quote, something I saw in one of Angel Deer's social media posts from Merlin the Wizard. There will come a day when you will understand that the whole universe lives within you. Then you will be a magician. As a magician, you do not live in the world. The world lives inside you. When this happens, you will begin manifesting instead of attracting, and you will realize that you lack nothing. You just haven't yet seen within you what you are looking for. If you've enjoyed this episode, if you learned something today, consider following the show. Subscribe to this on your favorite platform, or most important, leave Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube. Really helps a lot, and it means the world to me. Reviews, ratings, followers, subscribers, really, they're super important metrics because these platforms use your likes your reviews, your subscribes to move my content in front of those who are interested and need to hear this material. Thank you. Next week on the show, I'm speaking with Freddie Silva, who's a best-selling author, a leading researcher of ancient civilizations, restricted history, sacred sites, and their interaction with consciousness. Thank you for joining us today. It is a powerful day to have you with us. And remember, start your practice. So many beautiful ideas given today.